Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Happy day before Thanksgiving. I hope I hope you're all doing well and uh, having a great having a great week so far. And then uh, take a couple of days off, uh, and then we'll be back. And then the end of the semester is right around the corner. So um, keep that in mind. Um, our our next exam is a week from today. All right. So even though you have this holiday weekend, it's still going to be a little bit. Sorry, just the way it worked out with the with the calendar this year. I apologize for that. But exam number four is going to be on Wednesday. It's going to cover chapters 10 and 11. Okay. It's going to be a 60 minute exam. And as in the past, it'll be available between 2 and 11 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday. And as in the past, from 1 to 2, I'll have I'll be on Zoom to answer any last minute questions. All right. Uh, the final exam will come quickly right after that, it's gonna cover chapters one through 11. It's cumulative over the entire year, okay? And that's gonna be on Monday, December 7th, between two and 12, all right? It's a little bit longer exam. It's gonna be 110 minutes, all right? So uh, make sure you plan for those things. Uh, if you have any, any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Today, uh, we're gonna jump into chapter 11, the second on chemical bonding. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, all of you have already watched the videos that were assigned for today because they cover the material that we're gonna go through here. Um, and so we're gonna go fairly quickly simply because we're a little bit tight on time, okay? And I'm just gonna count on you watching those videos. I know mastering had a little glitch this morning for a couple hours, it was out, but it's back on now. So uh, it should be fine. You should be able to finish these assignments. Hopefully most of you we're able to see the videos uh, before that glitch happened, all right? Um, yes, the, the final is gonna be exactly the same format as all the rest. You're gonna be allowed a cheat sheet like you have in the past. You're gonna have the table of constants and the periodic table, right, calculator, same exact format. All right, just a little bit longer, a few more questions. I think it's gonna end up being around 60 questions or so, okay? Uh, all right, I have a question from Megan. Hi. Um, so the for the final exam, the day or last lecture before, will we be doing a mini review session at all? You know, um, I'll have a help session. I'll, I'll schedule a help session uh, for that day, like maybe, you, you know, around the same time I usually do, like right before, like between one and two. Um, but there will be any review. I will reassign um, the pretests but not for credit. I'll, I'll just assign them not for credit. So that could be a, a way to practice answering questions. So I'll put those back up on mastering, um, but there won't, we really don't have time to do any kind of review for the final. Thanks for that question. Any other question? No lab this week. Anything else? Okay, well, I want to, uh, happy birthday, Paola, on the day of the final. <laughs> Sorry to ruin your birthday. <laughs> oh, well, at least once you're done with that, then you can, then you can go celebrate. Maybe you can take it early. Um, let's see, what else was I going to tell you? Uh, let's see, Abe, question? Yeah, uh, whoa, does that sound staticky? A little bit, but that's okay. I can hear you. Okay, um... Uh, is there going to be like a pretest for the final? What I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the pretest for the other four exams. Um, they're not going to be for credit, so you don't have to do them. But if you want to retake them, you know, it'll reshuffle the answers and things like that. Um, and it'd be a good way to, to help you practice for the final. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, hey, thanks all of you that are here. Uh, and thanks you for turning on your cameras. I know this is the day before Thanksgiving, and um, but I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate you all being here. Uh, it's much better to to give a Zoom lecture to people than to just give it to nobody and then ha just watch people watch the recording. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, any more questions? Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So remember, uh, we're in the middle of uh, understanding of looking at bonding theories. And remember, I promised three bonding theories, right? The first theory was the Lewis model. In the Lewis model, a chemical bond is what? 
How did we define a chem pair? One more time. Like an electron pair between two. A shared electron pair, right. In the Lewis model, a chemical bond is a shared electron pair. Very, very good. The second model we're going to look at, and we're going to start looking at a little bit later today, is called um, valence bond theory. In valence bond theory, a chemical bond is overlap between half filled atomic quantum mechanical orbitals. Okay, so when you have two half filled orbitals, they can overlap and that lowers energy and that's a chemical bond according to valence bond theory. Okay, the third theory we're going to look at also today very quickly and briefly is molecular orbital theory. All right, so those are the three different models we have for chemical bonding. What we're going to start with today is something called VSEPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion, which is kind of an addition to the Lewis model that helps us predict molecular shapes from the Lewis structure of a molecule. All right. So VSEPR is kind of an add-on to the Lewis model, helps us predict molecular shapes from the Lewis structure for a molecule. All right. And the idea uh, is fairly simple. Um, let me start my slideshow here. Oh, uh, shoot, hold on. Uh, uh, the idea is fairly simple. Um, the, the geometry of the molecule is determined by repulsions between electron groups on central or interior atoms. All right, the geometry of a molecule is determined by repulsions between electron groups on central or interior atoms. So the idea is that if you have an electron group and let me define an electron group for you. And the electron group could be a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, or a lone pair, okay? Each of these counts as one electron group. So in this case, if we have a central atom and it's bonded to three other atoms, this doesn't have, this violates the octet rule, obviously. So this would be, have to be one of the exceptions to the octet rule. But if you have a central atom and it has three bonds like this, right? Then the idea is that those electrons repel one another and they're gonna get as far away from each other as possible. And they're gonna form this geometry, which is, called trigonal planar, okay? So that's the fundamental idea. So you can determine the geometry of a molecule simply by drawing its Lewis structure and then finding the geometry that gets the electron groups as far away from each other as possible. Why as far away from each other as possible? Because they're minimizing those repulsions, right? They wanna minimize those repulsions. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go through this really quickly. And again, this is all in the video. I'm gonna go through it quickly because most of you have already seen it in the video or are gonna see it. Um, but let me just review it here real quickly. So if you have two electron groups like this, they get away as far away from each other as possible and you get a linear geometry. CO2, notice that in this case, the two electron groups were, lone, were bonding groups, right? Single bonds. In this case, they're double bonds, but a double bond counts as one lone pair. In other words, all these electrons have to stay together. They can't get away from one another. The ones in the bond have to stay together. So both of these double bonds, each one counts as an electron group. The electron groups repel each other and get as far away from each other as possible. And you get a linear geometry with a 180 degree bond angle, okay? BF3 is an example of something with three electron groups like the one we looked at at the beginning. These are just single bonds. They get away from, as far away from each other as possible and you get a trigonal planar geometry, okay? Here's another example of three electron groups. In this case, it's a double bond and two single bonds. Still counts as how many electron groups? Three, all right? Three electron groups. 
they get away from as far away from each other as possible and you get again this trigonal plane of geometry but notice in this case the angle was 120 degrees uh that's what you'd predict you'd kind of predict the same thing for this molecule but when we go look at it in nature we find that it's not exactly 120. that's because these bonds are different kinds of bonds all right because a double bond has more electrons, it exerts a slightly greater repulsion than a single bond. So what happens here is that this bond angle is just a little bit bigger than this bond angle, right? So the greater repulsion here squeezes these together a little more than you'd expect, all right? But it's still pretty darn close to what we predict just based on three electron groups, okay? Um, you can kind of imagine these uh, repulsions as balloons. If you tie balloons together, each bond represent each electron group represents a balloon. Two balloons, right, would get this geometry. Three would get this. Now, when we go to four electron groups, you might think, oh, something like CH4 would be flat and that this bond angle would be 90 degrees. But what we've forgotten here is that, in fact, this can spread out in all three dimensions. Okay. So when it spreads out in three dimensions, the actual geometry that gives you the most distance between the electron groups, the most separation between the electron groups is this geometry, which is called tetrahedral. It's a tetrahedron because it, it, this fits inside a, a sort of four-sided little triangular pyramid. This geometric shape is called a tetrahedron, all right? And the bond angles there are 109.5, okay? Um, we know that in some cases, when we draw Lewis structures, we can get expanded octets. So PCL5, for example. Here you have one, two, three, four, five electron groups, all right? They assume this geometry, which is called trigonal bipyramidal, all right? These bond angles are 120. This bond angle is 90, all right? We call these the equatorial chlorines because you can think about this kind of like a globe. These are at the equator. And here's the axis, right? So these are called the axial chlorines. Notice they're different, right? These are separated from another chlorine by 90 degrees. These are separated from each other by a, a 120 degrees, all right? Here's the trigonal bipyramidal geometry with balloons, kind of so you can visualize it, right? Notice it's a triangular pyramid on top and a triangular pyramid on bottom. Hence the name trigonal bipyramidal. All right, in some cases with expanded octets, you can get six electron groups. Six electron groups, when they get as far away from each other as possible, you get this geometry, which is an octahedral geometry, um, named after an octahedron, which is basically two square pyramids, one, one up and one down. Octahedron means eight sides, right? Because there's four sides on top and four sides on the bottom. But all the bond angles are 90 degrees. Notice that this molecule or this shape doesn't have like an equatorial and axial positions the way that this does. Why is that? If I were to rotate this molecule by 90 degrees, I'd get exactly the same thing, right? All of these are separated by 90 degrees. There's no difference between some of them and the other ones. They're all identical, all right? That's not the case here. The equatorial ones are different than the axial ones. The equatorial ones are separated by, 90, by 120, the axial by 90. Here, everything is 90, all right? So those are, are very different in that respect. Okay, so there's a nice table in your book that summarizes all this. What I've showed you so far is the ge different geometries with central atoms that have only bonding groups and no lone pairs, right? Only bonding groups and have no lone pairs. So three electron groups, three bonding groups, trigonal planar, two and two, linear. Four and four, tetrahedral. Five and five is um, trigonal bipyramidal, and six and six is octahedral, okay? This table is gonna be very important. This table also includes what happens if some of the electron groups are lone pairs, which is what we'll look at next, okay? But those are, these are the basic shapes of the molecule when all of the groups on the central atom are all forming chemical bonds, all right? Are all bonding electrons, okay? Now, when you have lone pairs, 
the lone pairs continue to exert their influence, right? Even though there's not an atom attached to them, they still are gonna repel the other groups which may have bonds on them, right? So for example, here's ammonia. The Lewis structure for ammonia is this, okay? It has one, two, three, four electron groups. Because remember, this is an electron group. This is an electron group. This, these are all electron groups. They all have to stay together. This has to stay together. This has to stay together. But they repel one another, right? So when you get those repulsions, what happens is that the electron geometry, so let me define electron geometry, is the uh, geometry of the electron groups, okay? If we just look at the electron group, so here we have one, two, three, four, the electron geometry is tetrahedral, right? Just like when we had four bonding groups, right? In methane, still forms that tetrahedral shape. But now one of these is now a lone pair. So there's no atom attached to that, right? So the molecule ends up having this shape which is called trigonal pyramidal, okay? So we say the electron geometry is tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. All right, does that make sense? Are there any questions so far? I know I'm going pretty fast, but I'm hoping that most of you saw the video already. The names that you hear Is that a question I, could, I, I didn't get it if it was. I am, I am just confused about what's the difference between both of them. Why we have to use both the electron geometry and the tetrahedral and the molecular geometry trigonal pyramid. Oh, got it. Got it. So, so Gabby, ultimately what we're interested in is in the molecular geometry, but we can't predict the molecular geometry of this without understanding what the four electron groups do. Okay. So why is this bent? Because you might, if it just had three, three electron groups, it wouldn't be bent. It would just be flat, right? It would be, um, it would just be uh, trigonal, planar, right? But it's not trigonal planar. Why? Because of this fourth electron group right there. So in order to understand this geometry, we need to understand what this lone pair is doing. This lone pair is exerting its influence on all these other groups, right? And because of that, it's trigonal, uh, it's trigonal pyramidal, not tetrahedral. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yes, great, great, great question. Okay, um, now, just like, just like the case with, uh, that we saw up here, when we had one of the electron groups be a little different than the others, and we didn't get a perfect trigonal planar geometry, this happens with a lone pair as well. So what we would expect the perfect tetrahedral geometry to be 109.5 degrees. When we measure the bond angle in ammonia in NH3, we find that it's 107 degrees. Why is that? Because here we have one lone pair and three bonding groups. It turns out that the lone pair bonding group repulsion is a little bigger, a little stronger than the bonding group bonding group repulsion. In other words, this repulsion is a little bit greater than this repulsion right here, okay? In fact, the repulsion order goes like this. Right, so if we, if we rank the repulsions from greatest to lowest, right? The, the greatest repulsion is between two lone pairs. So lone pair, um, lone pair comma lone pair repulsion is the greatest repulsion, the most repulsion, okay? That's greater than uh, lone pair bonding pair, which is greater than bonding pair bonding pair. I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, is that because the electrons that are bonded are like connected to two yes. atoms, but the yes. ones on top are only connected to one. Correct. And so what happens is that when you have a lone pair, since they're not attracted to another atom, they're more, they have, they take up more angular space, right? They're spread out over a bigger angle than a bonding group. 
And because of that, they cause that repulsion to be stronger. Okay, thanks. Okay, great question. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, okay, it sounds like you guys are answering all your own questions there, so that's good. All right, let's go on. Um, what if you have two lone pairs and two bonding pairs? So let's say you have water, right? Now you have how many electron groups? One, two, three, four, okay? So the four electron groups assume the, ge the tetrahedral geometry again, right? Just like we expect four electron groups to do, but two of those don't have other atoms attached to it, right? So you, the molecule itself, the molecular geometry looks like this and it's bent, okay? We say that that's bent. Now, what would you predict for this bond angle compared to this one? Do you think it'd be smaller or bigger? Would water have a smaller bond angle or a bigger bond angle than ammonia? Smaller. Smaller, exactly right. Why? Because now there's two lone pairs and those repulsions are stronger, right? So that pushes in this even more than it did for ammonia. So instead of being the ideal bond angle of 109.5, which is what a normal tetrahedron is, in water, the bond angle is 104.5. All right. Does that make sense? Questions? I had a question. Yeah. Um, are we supposed to just, um, are we going to be given the, the degrees of the uh, angles and just have to know them? Uh, no, I want you to, I want you to know the ideal degrees, right? So like, I want you to know 109.5 for tetrahedral. I want you to know mm -hmm. 120 for trigonal planar, right? And so on. And then you don't have to memorize these just know that it's gonna be smaller than 109.5 due to that repulsion. Okay. Okay. So just here's a summary of this, right? If it's all bonding pairs and no lone pairs, like in CH4, right here's CH4, here's the Lewis structure, right? Bonding, 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 four bonding groups, no lone pairs. It's the ideal bond angle for a tetrahedron, 109.5. If one of those, is a lone pair, right? That exerts a little more repulsion and now it squeezes the bond angle, it's 107. If two of those are lone pairs, then that squeezes the bond angle even more and you get 104.5 like you do in water, okay? Again, the exact angles here, I don't want you to worry too much about. I want you to know this angle and then know that these are gonna be squeezed. This is gonna be squeezed a little bit and this is gonna be squeezed even a little bit more. All right, that's what I want you to know. All right, what about, so far we've looked at four electron groups with lone pairs. What about five electron groups with lone pairs, right? Here's the Lewis structure for SF4, all right? One, two, three, four, five electron groups. What's the electron geometry for five electron groups? Trigonal bipyramidal. Correct, trigonal, trigonal bipyramidal, all right? So now you can have the trigonal bipyramidal geometry and you can put the lone pair in two different places in the trigonal bipyramidal geometry, right? Why is that? Because remember that the axial positions are different than the equatorial positions, right? So here's a lone pair in an axial position. Here's the lone pair in an equatorial position. And the question is, which one is it? right? Well, it turns out that when we look in nature, it's this one. The lone pair goes here in the equatorial position. Why is that? Well, he, remember the order of repulsions, right? A lone pair bonding pair repulsion is greater than a bonding pair bonding pair repulsion. When you put the lone pair here in an axial position, you get three 90 degree interactions between lone pairs and bonding pairs, right? But when you put the lone pair here, how many 90 degree interactions do you have? You have two. You just have two, right? So this is more stable than that. And this is what ends up happening, okay? So this geometry is called a seesaw geometry. Why? Because if you turn it on its side, right? It kind of looks like a seesaw, right? 
if you turn this on its side, somebody can get on that side and you can go. My mom used to sing this song called Kachumbambe, uh, La Vieja Ine, Que Fuma Tabaco y Toma Café. That was her song she'd always sing to me when I was on a teeter totter. And uh, in Spanish, a teeter totter is called a Kachumbambe. And so it's Kachumbambe, La Vieja Ne, the old lady Ne. And this is the funny part Que Fuma Tabaco, that's, that smokes tobacco. He toma cafe and drinks coffee. <laughs> so that was my little uh, teeter totter song when I was a kid. All right. Um, this is what it looks like, right? If you, the lone pair is still here, but sometimes we don't put it in. I mean, we don't always put it in because we want to know what's the shape of the molecule, right? This is the shape of the molecule. Yeah. Everybody with me? Okay. What about if we have five electron groups, but now we have two lone pairs, right? Here's a structure, bromine, bromine trifluoride, five electron groups, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? Five electron groups, two of them are lone pairs. So again, anytime you have five electron groups, the electron geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, right? So the electron geometry for this, one, two, three, four, five is trigonal bipyramidal. The electron geometry for this is trigonal bipyramidal. But the molecular geometry is different for both of them, right? Because in this case, you have one lone pair. In this case, we have two, all right? So where do those lone pairs go? Turns out they continue to occupy those um, equatorial positions, all right? And that's because again, if you put it here, you'd have a 90 degree lone pair, lone pair interaction, right? And that's the most repulsive, right? So that doesn't happen. Instead, you put them here and here, and now you have a 90 degree, uh, uh, sorry, 120 degree lone pair, lone pair interaction. At the same time, you minimize the repulsions with the other bonding group. So it's not totally clear. You. Uh, just from examining it, that that's where it should go, but you just have to remember that that's where it does go, okay? So what you end up with is this T-shaped molecular geometry, yeah? All right, we could have five electron groups and three lone pairs, right? Like in xenon difluoride. Notice one, two, three, four, five. What's the electron geometry? Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal, exactly right. Now, the three lone pairs end up occupying all of those equatorial positions, right? And look at the molecule. The molecule is linear, right? Even though it has five electron groups, it has a linear ge molecular geometry, okay? All right, now what if we have, now let's go to six electron groups. So we already know the, the, if you have six electron groups and they're all bonding groups, what's the geometry? Octahedral. Octahedral, correct. If one of those is a lone pair, right? Where does a lone pair go? Well, it doesn't matter because it's all the positions are the same. So no matter where you put it, it will end up, you can always rotate it so it looks like this. And this is it's called a square pyramidal molecular geometry. Okay, again, the electron geometry is octahedral, as you would expect for six electron groups. One of them is a lone pair though, and that gives you the square pyramidal molecular geometry. All right. Does that mean that for all of them, the angles are gonna be the same? Yes, the angles are all gonna be 90 degrees. Now you might expect since this is a lone pair that these get, pushed up a little bit, right? So this angle might be a little bit less than 90 degrees, right? But the ideal okay. angle is 90 degrees. Okay. All right, again, six electron groups, but now we have two lone pairs with xenon tetrafluoride, right? Two lone pairs. So again, the electron geometry is what? Octahedral. Octahedral, right? But we have two lone pairs to put in. It turns out the two lone pairs get as far away from each other as possible, and you get a square planar geometry. All right. Um, all right, very good. So uh, remember, you're basically going to have to know all of these geometries we just went through and how to predict them based on a Lewis structure. So what I would do is I might say, 
uh, I might say, uh, I might give you a molecule like let's say SF4. I'll say SF4. Uh, what's the geometry of SF4, right? So what you would have to do, the first thing you would do is what? Lewis structure. You've got to draw the Lewis structure, right? You've got to draw the Lewis structure every single time, right? So the Lewis structure for SF4 is here. Notice it has that lone pair right there, right? So this is five electron groups. So what you do is you draw the Lewis structure, you count the electron groups on the central atom, and then you look at the number of lone pairs, and then you determine what the molecular geometry is, right? So for SF4, we have one, two, three, four, five electron groups. So we know the electron geometry is trigonal by pyramidal, but one of them is a lone pair, so you know that it's seesaw. Okay, that's what I want you to be able to do for all of those. All right, let's see. Why don't you go ahead and try this one? All right, try to put in an answer here in the next uh, 10 seconds or so. Okay, very good. The majority of you put C, which is the correct answer, right? Um, and that's because this molecule has one, two, three, four electron groups. One of them is a lone pair. So that corresponds to trigonal pyramidal. Okay, very good. Um, when you're representing, when you're drawing these structures, sometimes it's helpful to use this uh, uh, wedge and dash notation, right? So for a tetrahedral molecule like CH4, right? You might draw the carbon and then you draw two hydrogens in the plane of the paper like that, right? And then you draw one hydrogen going into the paper with a hash line and one coming out like that with a uh, wedge. If you were gonna draw, let's say a trigonal, a trigonal bipyramidal molecule, like for example, um, let's say uh, PCL5, right? You could do it like this, you could put the P, here, right, chlorine, 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 you could put three molecule, three of the chlorines in the pane of the paper, right? And then you could put one going in and one coming out like that, all right? So you can use this kind of hash and wedge to have things going into the paper or coming out of the paper, right? That's helpful when you draw things on paper, all right? Um, so here's all the different geometries drawn in this way, right? Trigonal pyramidal, trigonal bipyramidal, seesaw, just put three in the plane of the paper, one in, one out. Octahedral, usually you put these three in the plane of the paper and then two in and two out, right? And then square plane, you can put all in one plane. So you can just draw all on the plane of the paper. All right, what if you have more than one interior atom? Like this is an amino acid, right? It's glycine. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, all right? And you can apply this very simple model to amino acids, right? 
which will tell you the basic shape of an amino acid, which is pretty cool, right? That from a simple model like this, where we're drawing dots and dashes, and then we just assume that these electron groups repel each other. And all of a sudden we can kind of predict the basic shape of, amino, of an amino acid, right? That's pretty cool. So let's go through and see what the shape is at, at each of these individual interior atoms, right? Here's this nitrogen, four electron groups, one lone pair. What's the shape here? Tetrahedral. The electron geometry is tetrahedral, but what's the molecular geometry? What's the shape of the three bonds here around this nitrogen? Trigonal and pyramidal. Trigonal and pyramidal, right? It's just like the one we just did here, okay? So it's trigonal and pyramidal here. Okay, now this carbon has four electron groups, no lone pairs. So what's the geometry there? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral, exactly right. Okay, so we got trigonal pyramidal, tetrahedral. What about here? We have one, two, three electron groups, no lone pairs. Notice that these lone pairs here don't matter, right? You don't have to worry about lone pairs on terminal atoms, only the interior atoms, right? Because that's where... That's what determines the geometry, right? This is just a terminal atom. There's no other atoms bonded to it. So the geometry there doesn't matter, right? The only matters in the interior atoms, right? So here, what's the geometry here with three electron groups? No lone pairs. Trigonal planar. Trigonal, Trigonal planar. planar, correct, correct. And then the last one, four electron groups. Two of them are bonding groups and two of them are lone pairs. What's the geometry there? Bent. 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 Exactly right, bent. So we put all that together and there we go. There's the shape of the amino acid glycine, right? Trigonal pyramidal, tetrahedral here, trigonal planar here, and bent there. Crazy, right? And we go out in nature, we look at this amino acid and guess what? It's shaped like this. It makes no sense, <laughs> right? Very simple model. We can predict the shapes of amino acids. Of course, if this amino acid was linked to more amino acids, we can get the basic shape of that. And in fact, you can put that all together. And then the amino acids, of course, start to interact with one another, which is why proteins bend and fold, right? But you can put together all that information and you have a very strong way to predict and, uh, and understand the shapes of proteins, right? Including those on the coronavirus, including those that were trying to make molecules to block, right? To block the action of some of those proteins, right? And that's exactly how this works. In fact, AIDS drugs were developed, were developed this way, HIV drugs. We got the structure of the protein, we figured it out, and then we built, we basically built molecules to jam up, to fit perfectly into the site that was doing the work of making more viruses, right? It was like an inhibitor. And we, yes, protease inhibitors, exactly correct. And so we, we figured that out. We built those molecules and it didn't cure AIDS, but it provided um, a lifetime drug regimen that pretty much brings the virus to undetectable levels in people that are HIV infected, right? In the old days, when AIDS first came out, everyone that got AIDS would die pretty quickly. Now with these drugs, they pretty much can live a normal lifespan, right? Crazy, just because of things like this, okay? All right, very, very good. Any questions? Oh, I see a couple of questions. Emily? I just wanted to clarify. So did you say that terminal lone pairs will not affect the repulsion for the angle? Correct, like correct. These have no effect. It's only the ones on interior atoms. Okay, but like that double bond right there. That double bond would make it a little bit, so we'd expect this to be trigonal planar, but it's not exactly 120 degrees because of the double right. bond. Okay, but we can just ignore those. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, Thank you. good question. Uh, Megan? Do you mind briefly explaining the bent structure? Because since there are two electrons on the, like on, or two pairs on each side, I thought it would be straight or linear. Here? Not that one, the oh, other one. bent structure, oh yes. The bent structure, so remember the bent structure, uh, let's go back here. The bent structure is, um, two lone pairs, right? But remember in, in three dimensions, all four electron groups assume this tetrahedral geometry, right? 
It looks like it might be on paper. It looks like it might just be square, but it's not, right? Because in three dimensions, they, they assume this tetrahedral geometry, which means that the molecular geometry then is bent. Right, you'd predict this bond angle to be 109.5 or a little smaller because you have two lone pairs here. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Any, any other questions? Okay, one of the important properties we can predict about a molecule once we know its shape is its polarity. Okay whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar. That's hugely important to a lot of the properties of the molecule. So for example, um, oils tend to be very nonpolar. Uh, water is very polar, all right? And you know that when you mix oil and water, for example, they don't mix, right? They'll separate out, okay? And in biology, polar versus nonpolar is also super important in terms of understanding a lot of functions that happen in the cell and a lot of uh, metabolism and things like that, right? So we wanna be able to understand how can we go from the shape of the molecule to be able to predict something that's super important, namely polarity. So let me remind you that when you have two atoms bonded together and they have different electronegativities, that produces a polar bond, right? In this case, the chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen, which means the chlorine hogs electrons, right? They don't share them very equally. This part is more negative and this part's more positive. And we say that we have a polar bond, right? We talked about this already earlier on, okay? Uh, however, when you have more than one bond, in this case, if you have a polar bond, then the molecule itself is of course polar, all right? But when you have multiple polar bonds, they could either cancel each other out, in which case the molecule is nonpolar, or they can add together and not cancel each other out in such a way that the molecule is polar. So let's look at two examples of that. Here's CO2, right? We figured out that the, that the geometry of CO2 is linear, right? Now, the carbon-oxygen bond is indeed a polar bond, all right? The oxygen is more electronegative, so this part of it hogs the electron uh, the electron density, more electron density here than here. And we say this is a polar bond, but this also is a polar bond. And because the molecule is linear, the two polar bonds are, are pointing in exactly opposite directions, okay? This would be like if you had two big dogs, let's see, can I draw a dog? Dog there, oh geez really bad. I don't know if those look like dogs or rabbits or what. But anyway, let's suppose you had two big dogs on a leash and they were pulling in exactly opposite directions. What happens to their pulls? You don't move. You just stay in the center. You don't move, right? They would cancel each other out, right? You got the two pulls, right? It might hurt your arms a little bit, but you're not going to go in either direction, right? Because the two pulls exactly cancel each other out. Similarly, these two dipole moments, right? These two po polar bonds pointing in exactly opposite directions cancel each other out, all right? So that the CO2 molecule is nonpolar, right? And, we, and, and the reason you could predict that is because you now know how to predict the geometry of CO2 as being linear. And so those two would cancel each other out. If CO2 was not linear, right, then they wouldn't cancel each other out. So let's look at another example, water, right? So that we know that water is a bent molecule, right? Again, the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So this is a polar bond and this is a polar bond, right? And so because of that, these polar bonds, because it's bent and not linear, these polar bonds don't cancel each other out, right? If you were being pulled by two dogs and one was pulling you this way and the other one was pulling you that way, right? You would move in that direction. Yeah? I have a question. They don't cancel each other out. Yeah, question? Is that one of the reasons that water is like the universal solvent? So water is very good at, at dissolving substances that are polar or ionic. And yes, it's because it is itself polar. But water is not very good at dissolving substances that are nonpolar. 
So for example, if you put oil or gasoline in the water, it won't dissolve it, right? That's because the water is polar and the, and the gasoline or the oil is non-polar. So is that because like the polar ones are kind of like held in place. Correct. Or, sorry, the, the non-polar ones are kind of like held in place better. Uh, or... The polar molecules are attracted to each other. Let's see, do I have a good analogy here? Yeah. So here's, here's oil, which is non-polar and water, which is polar. When the molecule is polar, it has a positive end and a negative end, right? Kind of like little magnets. So they're attracted to each other. Yes, it's so, going to attract to like other elements better. Correct. So for example, you can look at, you can, do you, have you guys ever seen those little magnetic marbles? You know, that they're like marbles, but they have magnets in them. So they attract each other. So water is kind of like magnetic marbles and they're attracted to each other fairly strongly. And the oil molecules are, are have much weaker attractions between them. All right. And so what happens is that the water attracts other water molecules and squeezes the oil out, right? Which is why they separate like this. Oh, okay. okay. Um, all right, so how do you determine if a molecule is polar? Draw its Lewis structure, number one. Two. Determine if it has polar bonds. If the bonds are not polar, then can the molecule ever be polar? No, right? If you have, if you have non-polar bonds, then the molecule is non-polar no matter what, okay? But if you have polar bonds, the next thing would be to determine the molecular geometry. Right, determine the molecular geometry. And then fourthly, uh, determine if the polar bonds cancel or add together. Do they cancel or add together, right? In this case, they cancel each other out because they're opposing one another. In this case, they add together because they're not opposing one another, right? Now it can get a little more complicated when you have more complicated molecules. Um, you basically have to think about this as a little bit of vector addition, right? So when you add vectors together, if you have a vector, if you have a polar bond this way, and another polar bond this way, and you want to figure out the net vector, right? Um, you know bonds are polar if they're between atoms of different electronegativities, right? We talked about that a little bit earlier. Anytime you have a bond between two atoms of different electronegativities, then you have a polar bond, all right? Um, so let's do a couple of examples here. Here's ONCO and, we want to, and, and SO3, and we want to determine if they're polar, all right? So first of all, ONCL. First of all, we draw the Lewis structure. I've already done that for you. Secondly, we ask, are these polar bonds? So is the NO bond polar? It's not really that big of a difference. Uh, it's, it's big enough, right? Okay. Even though they're, they're close to each other. Anything, pretty much anytime you have two different atoms, except for, I think, things like carbon and sulfur or carbon and hydrogen are close enough that they're not really polar. But most of the time that you have different atoms bonded together, the electronegativity difference is enough that it will be polar. Not 100% of the time, but 90% of the time, okay? In some cases, you might have to go look it up and see how big the electronegativity difference is. But in this case, it's three for nitrogen and three and a half for oxygen. I think we said that anything over 0.4 difference was polar, right? And so it's over 0.4 difference, so that's polar. What about the NCL bond? Non-polar. No, not polar. That is non-polar. Is that right? Do I have that right? Oh yeah, okay, that's non-polar. Yeah. Okay, so um, then we have to look at um, the geometry, right? What's the geometry of this molecule? Bent. Bent, three electron groups, right? One lone pair, so it's bent. So we have oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine like this, okay? We have one polar bond right here right? 
This bond's nonpolar, right? So what can we say about the molecule? It's polar. It's polar, right? Because there's nothing to cancel that one, right? There's nothing to cancel that one. And even if this bond would have been a little bit polar as well, it still would have been polar, right? Because they wouldn't cancel each other out, okay? Now, what about SO3? You got sulf, you got three electron groups, right? No lone pairs. So what's the geometry about this sulfur? Trigonal planar? Yep, trigonal planar. O, O, O. Okay. Are these bonds polar? Oxygen and uh, oxygen and sulfur. Yes. Yes, they're yeah. polar. So you got a polar bond there, polar bond there, polar bond there. Now let's say you were, let's say I'm looking down at you here. So this is you and you have three big dogs on three leashes and they're pulling you this direction, this direction, this direction, separated by exactly 120 degrees. Would those pulls all cancel each other out or would you end up moving in some direction? all cancel each other out. They would all exactly cancel each other out, okay? Because they're all at 120 degrees to one another, all right? And so this is nonpolar. Okay, I see a couple of questions. Emily. Never mind, it was answered. Okay, uh, Abe. Yeah, I, I got two questions. Um, the first one is how, how does it cancel out on the first one and then uh, why doesn't the double bond make a difference for the SO3? Yeah, great question. So um, on the first one, it doesn't cancel out because you only have one polar bond. But even if you had two, even if that was polar, they still wouldn't cancel, right? If, if, oh, if so they only cancel when it's po between polar bonds? Correct. Okay, and then, all right. Yep. In this case, um, the double bond does make a difference, which means that this bond angle is a little bit bigger than... Well, okay, actually, never mind. I'm wrong. Um, remember that SO3, what I've drawn here is one of the resonance structures. There's actually two more, mm -hmm. right? That move this double bond around. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. So in, in reality, even though it looks like this bond is different than those, in fact, it's not, right? Because the resonance yeah. structures tell you that they're all the same. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that wasn't the case for... Um, this molecule, which we looked at earlier, right? You can't draw resonance structures for this because the hydrogens can't form double bonds, right? But in this case, you can, so they're all equivalent. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Um, if the electronegativity different, if the electronegativities are close, I would give it to you, okay? Otherwise, just remember the trends in electronegativity and know that generally, if you have two different atoms, except in some cases, uh, usually when you have a bond between two atoms, it's gonna be a polar bond. Not always, because it might be coincidental that the electronegativities are close enough, but most of the time um, you will have a polar bond when you have a bond between two different atoms. Um, I also have a question. Yeah. So like double bonds and triple bonds, since they affect the angle, they're gonna affect like if it's polar, um, you know what it's because that's a because because they affect the angle so little you could you, you you don't have to take that into consideration when you're considering polarity okay okay all right awesome all right that is the end of the lewis model and the Vesper that we add onto it to be for, to allow us to predict geometries, okay? And that's the model we'll be using the most, all right? We are gonna look at two other models for chemical bonding. And the next one we're gonna look at is called valence bond theory. And in valence bond theory, a chemical bond is the overlap between half-filled orbitals. And I'm gonna be more clear, half-filled atomic orbitals. All right. Um,
So it turns out that when you have, this is the energy of the electrons in H2 as a function of their separation. And you don't have to worry about this too much. I'm just showing you that when you have two half filled orbitals and they overlap, energy goes down. That's all you have to remember from this, okay? When you have two half filled orbitals and they overlap, energy goes down. If the orbitals are completely full and they overlap, energy would go up as they get closer together, all right? But if they're half filled and they overlap, energy goes down. So what that means is that anytime you have half filled orbitals in atoms, they can overlap with half filled orbitals on other atoms and they can lower their energy that way. And that's what we call a chemical bond in valence bond theory, all right? So let's consider the molecule H2S, right? So in the Lewis model, right, we would draw the Lewis structure, right? We could predict the shape of this, right? It would be four electron groups, two lone pairs. So it would be bent, right? We'd predict um, a bond angle of a little bit less than 109.5 degrees, right? Based on the Lewis model, okay? If we apply valence bond theory to this, again, this is another theory for bonding. Now, a chemical bond is the overlap between half filled orbitals. So then we'd wanna say, okay, what orbitals in these atoms are half filled, right? So if you think about hydrogen, its electron configuration is 1s1. So there's a half filled orbital, right? 1s. If you think about the other hydrogen it would be the same thing. Right, so we have 1s. And then if we think about the sulfur, right, its electron configuration, sorry, is 3s2, 3p4, right? So it, ha here's the 3s orbital, two electrons. Here are the three, 3p orbitals. They have four electrons, one, two, three, four. Right, so how many bonds can hydrogen form? Two. Uh, each hydrogen can only form one. Because remember, what's a chemical bond? Overlap between half-filled atomic orbitals. How many half-filled orbitals does hydrogen have? One. One, so how many bonds can hydrogen form? One. One, does that make sense? Look at sulfur. How many half-filled orbitals does sulfur have? Two. Two, this one and this one. So how many bonds can the sulfur form? Two. 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 All right. So if we want to draw the molecule, right, we'd say, okay, here's the sulfur. I know that it's bonding by the overlap of its half-filled 3p orbitals, right? So I'm going to draw one 3p orbital like this and one 3p orbital like that, right? There's another 3p orbital that has two electrons in it. Do I have to worry about that one when it comes to bonding? No, only half filled orbitals can bond. There's a 3s orbital on the sulfur. Do I have to worry about that with, this, with regard to bonding? No. no. Again, no. Why? Because it has two electrons in it. Only half filled orbitals can overlap with other half filled orbitals to form chemical bonds, right? So here's one of the p orbitals. It goes up and down this whole ray. And here's the other p orbital right here, right? And then we could say, okay, the hydrogen, what kind of orbital is involved in bonding in the hydrogen atom? Is it a p orbital? No, it's an s orbital. It's an s orbital, right? So here's the hydrogen. S orbitals look like that, right? And it has one electron. Here's my other hydrogen. It has one electron. So there's my model for the molecule according to valence bond theory, all right? This is the Lewis model up here. This is the valence bond model down here, okay? Notice that in the valence bond model, the electrons are not dots right? They exist in these orbitals. A chemical bond is the overlap between half-filled orbitals.
okay? Usually in valence bond theory, we label each bond based on the kind of bond and the kind of orbitals that are overlapping. So this bond is called a sigma bond, and there's really only two kinds of bonds, sigma and pi. I'll show you the, pi, the way a pi bond differs from a sigma bond a little bit later, all right? But for right now, I'm just gonna tell you this is called a sigma bond. And then we draw, then we use a notation that tells us what kinds of orbitals are overlapping. So on the sulfur, the kind of over, orbital that we're using to bond is a 3p orbital. And on the hydrogen, the kind of orbital that's doing the overlapping is a 1s orbital, right? So this is the model that comes out of valence bond theory. Now, in when we learned about S, P, and D orbitals, right? What is the what is the angle between these two P orbitals? What is that angle right there? Do you remember? Was it like a little less than like 109? Well, remember the P orbitals, there was there's three of them, right? They're, they go like this, like this, and then in and out of the paper. So there are three orbitals and they're all exactly orthogonal to one another, right? Would it be 90? So it would be nine degrees, exactly right. So this angle would be nine degrees. So valence bond theory predicts that this angle is 90 degrees, right? So it predicts sulfur, hydrogen, hydrogen, 90 degrees. Notice that my two models are predicting different things, okay? My Lewis model is predicting ah, a little bit less than 109.5, right? My valence bond model is predicting 90 degrees. Why? Because here, the bond angle is determined by the repulsions between these electron groups. Here, the bond angle is determined by what? The orbitals that are overlapping, right? And since in this case, it's two P orbitals that are overlapping and they're 90 degrees separated, right? We would predict a bond angle of 90 degrees. So I know you guys are all on the edge of your seats. What is the bond angle when we go measure it in nature, right? What is it? Well, when we go measure the bond angle in nature, guess what? It's 92 degrees, okay? So in this case, valence bond theory wins. Valence bond theory predicts something closer to what we actually see. Now, to be fair, you know, this is 109, you know, because of the repulsions of the lone pairs, we might say, oh, it's 103 or something like that, right? But still, which one's closer? Valence bond theory for H2S. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Questions? Megan. So would it work for like, so do certain molecules that works better with the other theory or? Yeah, and I, I chose this example because this is one of the ones that works very well. And it works with what we call unhybridized atomic orbitals, but we're gonna see that valence bond theory has to get a little more complicated in order to explain the geometry of, of a lot of other molecules. All right, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Megan, did you have a question? Yeah, when, um, like if we didn't, if we weren't able to measure them in nature, like when do you know which theory Oh. Like model to utilize. Oh, that is such a great question. I love that question. Science without experiment is blind, right? We wouldn't know. If we couldn't measure it in nature, we wouldn't know, right? So in science, we build models. And sometimes those, I mean, it's interesting, you know, you're seeing this right now with coronavirus, right? All these scientists are building models to trying to predict what's going to happen with coronavirus. Well, a lot of the times the models are wrong. Right? If you couldn't measure it in nature, you couldn't confirm your model. So science always has to build models and then go to nature to check that model, right? And if it doesn't work, then you got to come back and modify your model or modify your theory. And that kind of reiterative process is what gives science its power, right? Before about four or 500 years ago, when science really grew, People would just have ideas and they wouldn't go test them in nature. They wouldn't observe nature to see if their ideas were right, right? That's what science, that's what science is all about. Science is all about, okay, we have these two models. Which one's right? Let's go to nature, measure the bond angle. We have to use a very tiny little protractor, 
to measure these bond. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but, it, but these bond angles can be measured, okay? And, um, and once you have the bond angle, then you can determine which one's right. But without nature, you don't know. Great question. I love that kind of question. Okay. So here is kind of a, a, a little bit better picture than what I've drawn, right? Here's the, here's the sulfur atom, here are the hydrogen atoms. This shows all of the orbitals on the sulfur, right? There's the S orbital, which has two electrons. And then there's the three P orbitals. Notice that two of the P orbitals are involved in bonding with the hydrogen, but one P orbital, this one right here, has that lone pair and is not involved in bonding, okay? All right, let's see if you can answer this question. See if you're following me, okay. Okay, 10 more seconds. Try to try to type in an answer here in the next 10 or 15 seconds. Okay, nice work. Um, the right answer is one. And uh, most of you got that. We got a couple other little guess, a little a couple other little wrong answers here, but Let's, so let's have a look here. If you have 2s2, 2p5, right? If that's the electron configuration, then the orbital diagram looks like this, right? You have a 2s orbital with two electrons. You have your three 2p orbitals. One of them has two electrons. The other one has two electrons. And the third one has one electron, right? What's the criteria for being able to form a bond? Half filled, right? one electron. So how many bonds can you form? One. One, right? Only one bond for that 2p electron, right? That's it. Does that make sense? So uh, for example, uh, you can look at chlor Cl2, right? Cl2 has this electron configuration, right? So each chlorine atom is gonna bond via, each one of them has one of those two P electrons. So you can have overlap between those two, right? And you'd label that sigma chlorine 2P overlapping with chlorine 2P, right? So anytime you have half filled electrons, half filled orbitals, sorry, they can overlap and they can form a bond just like this, okay? Now, any questions before we move on? Taylor. <laughs> 
So is that why all the halogens are diatomic? Exactly right. Yep. They all bond with that um, p orbital. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, Wait. and even like uh, H two, right? H two has each hydrogen atom is one s one, right? So you can have hydrogen, hydrogen, electron here, electron here. So my bond is sigma hydrogen 1s overlapping with hydrogen 1s. Okay, that's the way you describe bonding in valence bond theory. Now, the thing that gets a little more complicated is this. So far, I have been using just the normal s and p orbitals that we all know and love from atoms, right? We know that we have s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, right? All of that stuff that we've already learned for atoms. It turns out in valence bond theory, you could either use those orbitals, but in many cases, if you just use those orbitals, you don't get an adequate description. You don't get an accurate description. In other words, what, what, you, what you predict is not what you see in nature. And I'll give you an example of that. Let's say we were trying to predict the, the, um, the bonding in CH4, right? We know that the Lewis, in the Lewis model, right? There's our Lewis structure, right? We'd say that there's four electron groups. So we'd say it's tetrahedral, right? Carbon goes like this, right? Tetrahedral, we would predict these bond angles to be 109.5. So this is the Lewis description. Turns out, you know, we go measure this in nature and it's exactly 109.5. So the Lewis model along with Vesper nails this exactly correctly, all right? But now let's look at what valence bond theory does. So we say, ah, carbon, Carbon is um, 2s2, 2p2, right? So 2s, 2p, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Hydrogen, of course, is just 1s1. So according to valence bond theory, what we know so far, how many bonds can carbon form? Two. Only two, right? Only two. And so we would predict that the, car the, mo the molecule that forms between carbon and hydrogen would actually have the formula CH2, not CH4. And if the, over and if the bonding occurs between the 1s orbital on the hydrogen, the 2p orbitals on the carbon, right? Here's one of those 2p orbitals. Here's the other one, right? the molecule would look something like this. And notice the bond angle here is what? 90 degrees, not 109.5, not right? And so it turns out that when we go into nature, this doesn't exist. So this is a colossal failure on the part of valence bond theory. The problem is, so it turns out when that happens and you go back to the model and you, and you rearrange it, you adjust it to see if it can, you can make it work. All right, so it turns out you can make it work, but you have to use something called hybridized, hybridized atomic orbitals, all right? What that means is that the bonding in CH4 doesn't happen through the standard S and P orbitals that we all know and love. It happens through what's called hybridized atomic orbitals. So, Remember that the atomic orbitals were just mathematical functions, right? And that's what gives us the atomic orbitals and we know their energies and we know their shapes, right? Well, it turns out that you can mathematically add these together in different ways and you can get four brand new orbitals that are hybrids of these. What's a hybrid? Um, you know from, do I have a picture of this? Oh, I guess I forgot to put a picture of this in here. Um, what is a hybrid? Where does that term come from? Just from like mixing two things together. Yeah, right? Like if you get a, 
Labrador and a poodle and you breed them, you get a hybrid, which is called a what? Labradoodle. Labradoodle, right? It's a mix of those two dogs, yeah? Similarly, you can take this orbital and all three of these, right? And you can mix them and you get these hybrids, okay? The rules for hybridization are that you get as many orbitals out as you put in, right? So if you put in one, two, three, four, you get out four, okay? And this is not completely random. We're not just dreaming this up. This is actually done mathematically and we can do that and we can actually get the energies and the shapes of these hybrids, just like we know the energies and the shapes of these atomic orbitals, okay? So the energies it turns out are shown here in this energy diagram. So the energy of the sp3 hybrid orbitals is kind of in between the 2s and the 2p, all right? But when you mix them together, it kind of averages out and you get four identical orbitals of identical energy. Um, their only difference is how they're oriented in space, okay? So here's the S and the three Ps. You do this mathematical thing where you add them together and you get four new ones. And here's what they look like, right? Each hybrid orbital kind of looks like this. It has a big lobe and a small lobe. And the four orbitals are pointed, are, are separated from one another by 109.5 degrees. So here are the individual orbitals and here they all are together, all right? Notice that in this drawing, I've left out this little tiny back lobe. Why? Because it would just make the drawing too complicated, okay? So we're focusing on this big lobe that points in this direction. We're leaving out this little back lobe, all right? And you get this. And so now if you look at, um, if you look at this hybridized orbital compared to a normal P orbital, we can understand why this happens. This happens because a P orbital, when it overlaps with another orbital, because the nucleus is right here, the most that it can overlap is half of the orbital, right? It can never overlap with the other half of the orbital, okay? Now, when you get a hybridized orbital, a lot of the electron density goes into one lobe at the expense of the other one. So now you can get more overlap. More overlap means lower energy, okay? So in other words, hybridized orbitals are good bond forming orbitals because they can overlap better. Because they can overlap better, they can lower energy more, right? So that's why this happens. So here's a picture of carbon, CH4. And instead of using the P orbitals now, we can use the hybrid. So carbon, uh, if we go S, uh, carbon, if we take the um, S orbitals, right, uh, carbon, S, P, we remember we had one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. No, that was wrong. Carbon, S, P, one, two, three, four electrons. We thought we could only form two bonds, but if we hybridize them, right, we get one, two, three, four orbitals, all of the same energy. We call those sp3 hybrids, okay? sp3 hybrids. Now we have one, two, three, four electrons. One, two, three, four, right? So now how many bonds can carbon form? Now it can form four. Now it can form four, okay? Now notice that these, these orbitals are no longer these p orbitals, they're these new hybrid orbitals, right? So how are they oriented? They're oriented in this tetrahedral geometry. So you have one in the plane of the paper there, one in the plane of the paper there, one going into the paper, and one coming out of the paper, right? Now each of these four has one electron, right? So each one can form a bond to a hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom, of course, is still gonna bond through its S electron, right? It's one S electron. So you got boom, boom, 
boom, boom, right? So each of these bonds are the same. Now, if we label that, we'll say it's hydrogen bonding through its 1s orbital with carbon. But now instead of bonding through its p orbital, carbon is bonding through its sp3 hybrid orbital, right? So we label the bond sigma hydrogen 1s bonding with carbon sp, uh, sp3, right? And these are the sp3 orbitals. And since these are separated by 109.5 degrees, this description now exactly matches what we see in nature, okay? Because this is exactly what we see in nature, right? So valence bond theory, when you add in this concept of hybridization, could do a very good job at predicting what we actually see, okay? All right, I see a couple more questions. I'll take them. If you need to go, go ahead and go, but I'll, I'll take these two questions and then I'll end class. Uh, Abe, was that Abe? Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like, I guess, how would you know? And like, yeah. how, how would you know to hybridize them? Yeah. So right now uh, we haven't gotten to that yet. What we're eventually gonna do is cheat a little bit. We're gonna, so, so normally what you do is you do a mathematical calculation of how much to hybridize. And when you do that mathematical calculation for uh, let's say H2S, that mathematical calculation would tell you that it's not energetically favorable to hybridize, right? Okay. And so you would, you would learn that if you did that mathematical calculation that unhybridized, you get lower energy than if you hybridize. If you did that mathematical calculation for CH4, you'd find that it's energetically favorable to hybridize in that case. So normally when you apply valence bond theory, you do these fairly complex mathematical calculations that tell you whether or not to hybridize, okay? What we're gonna do is a little bit simpler than that. We're gonna say that in general, and this works 95% of the time, in general, if you're looking at a central atom, you always hybridize the orbitals. If you're looking at a terminal atom, you never hybridize them. Okay. And, and, and that, then that tends to work. It doesn't work uh, for H2S, but it works for a lot of things. Yeah, go ahead. And, and then, um, so you have like sort of like, um, I guess four electrons in the P3 or um, hybrid orbital. How many electrons can um, that hybrid orbital carry or have? So like all orbitals, they can only take two max. Oh, no. So that hybrid orbital, hybrid orbital can now take eight because it kind of like combined with the Co S and P? Correct. Okay. It can take a maximum of eight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good it. question. Thank you. Okay. Other, any other questions before I end class? And also, um, I, I think you need to, yeah, go ahead, Francesca. Sorry. Um, so is this like one of the ways that scientists can help predict like if in, like new compounds or something? Yes, absolutely. Right. Because you can do you can do calculations that'll tell you whether a particular compound might be stable or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can actually calculate the energies of the electrons in these orbitals and you can figure out the stability of the molecule that way. So again, like all of our bonding models, what we want our bonding models to do for us is tell us, okay, what combinations of atoms are stable? What combinations are not? Two, what does the molecule look like? What is its geometry, right? Three, how long are the chemical bonds? For the Lewis theory, we can never, Lewis theory has no power to tell us how long the chemical bonds are. Since these calculations, you actually calculate the energy, you can move this in and out and actually figure out from theory how long these chemical bonds are. And then we go into nature and we measure them. And in fact, it gives us a pretty close number to what it actually is in nature. This is kind of the fun part of science, right? When you can build a model kind of out of your head, right? You build a model for nature and then you apply the model and then you check nature to see if the model is making predictions that agree with what your model predicts, right? And then if it does, then you have a good model. You're on the right track in terms of you're capturing something about what's actually going on in nature. Are models ever perfect? Probably not. Right? All models are, 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 are exactly that. They're a model of what we see in nature, right? But they capture some of what is there. 
right? And that's kind of the power and the fun of science. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and officially end class right now. And um, I will stick around though, of course, to answer questions, but thank you all for coming. Uh, have a really great Thanksgiving. Stay safe out there. Uh, we're getting so close to having a vaccine uh, that we're, we're in the home stretch of all this. So stay safe, have a great weekend, have a great Thanksgiving. Love you all, take care. Thank you.